now we begin our discussion of the zeroth law and the idea of temperature in fact the zeroth law is a funny law of thermodynamics unlike the other laws which give us an equation the zeroth law does not give us an equation the first law said that well d e is an exact differential the second law will also say that something else some combination is an exact differential leading to the property entropy just the way first law led to the property energy zeroth law does not give an equation for temperature in fact the special thing about zeroth law is it gives us a geometric or a state space interpretation of temperature it gives us some idea about how to measure temperature but just an idea it does not give a thermodynamic basis for the measurement of temperature and although we may think otherwise zeroth law does not tell us what a higher temperature is and what a lower temperature is using zeroth law we have conventionally defined a large number of temperature scales and just by convention for convenience we have defined larger numbers to mean hotter stuff and cooler numbers to mean cooler stuff you know traditionally we know that steam is hotter because we have decided to call anything which is which behaves like steam as hot steams flames are hot whereas something which is frozen like ice is cold so hot and cold are relative ideas and the higher temperature and lower temperatures are conventional directions of numbers higher numbers and lower numbers which we have associated with it it is only the second law in fact temperature is an involved entity both in zeroth law as well as in the second law and it is only after going to the second law that thermodynamic uh, temperature will have a proper thermodynamic basis for its measurement so temperature is something which pervades two laws one definition or the basic definition using zeroth law and second one the proper thermodynamic basis for its measurement in the using the second law so just the way the first law helped us define two entities one a property of state called energy and two an interaction called the heat interaction okay the second law when we come to it will allow us to define entropy and also provide a basis for measurement of temperature now notice that although the nomenclature is zeroth law first law second law historically the ideas were developed first as those for second law by carnot then for first law by joule and others and finally by zeroth law but the way we are studying it or developing our exposure of thermodynamics it's in the another way first law zeroth law and then second law of course there is nothing unique about it this is the way well many people and many textbooks develop it and i find that it's the most neat and convenient way of developing things and explaining thermodynamics so what is zeroth law if first law is the statement of systems bounded or interacting across an adiabatic wall zeroth law is a study of the behavior or generalization of behaviors of systems related by non adiabatic walls now before we do that let's again look at the consequences we have using the first law de is dq minus dw 
or if we restrict ourselves, if d e is d u, then we end up with d u equals d q minus d w. Now, this u as a property, what does it depend on? Let us look at it. It turns out that if you write d u as d q minus d w expansion plus d w electric plus so on. You will notice that d w expansion can be written as something like p d v. So, you change the volume, you are likely to have a change in u. This is something like E d q. So, you change the amount of charge, well, you are likely to change d u. So, d u is likely to be a function of some properties of state that v and q and all that depending on the complexity of the system. But then it turns out that without doing any work, you can have all work interactions to be 0. Then even by having some heat type of interaction, you can change the internal energy of a system. So, that means apart from this, u is a function of some other property. What is that property? that is one question. The second thing is on how many properties does u depend on? Why just u? Just the complete state of the system depend on. And that brings us to the second state postulate. Although this is a state postulate to or state principle, after studying the second law, we will see a demonstration of why this postulate turns out to be true. And here we come back to our the definitions yesterday of a simple system, a complex system and uh, the rudimentary system. The state postulate too says that the number of independent intensive properties. By intensive, we can say either intensive or specific. That means, for a system of fixed mass or a closed system, required to define the state of a system equals number of two way work modes plus 1. This is the state postulate 2. The state postulate 1 was that the state of a system can always be defined in terms of primitive properties. Which primitive properties thermodynamics does not tell us? How many at that time we did not know? Now, here we have the answer to how many. The answer to how many is find out the number of two way work modes 
add 1 to that and that means if we have a simple system the number of properties needed is number of two way work mode plus 1 which is 1 plus 1 because for a simple system number of two way work mode is 1 is 2. And an illustration of this is if you have a simple compressible system like a fluid then the two properties could be for example, pressure and volume or pressure and specific volume if it is a constant mass system closed system. Okay. So, pressure and specific volume would be the two independent intensive properties. What happens if you have a complex system? The number of properties needed will be greater than 2. Again this is n 2 w plus 1. Since n theta 2 w is greater than 1, this will be greater than 2. Depending on the number of comp, uh, level of complexity, it could be 3, 4 and so on. Most of our systems or almost all systems which we are going to work with are going to be simple systems of some kind or the other, usually simple compressible systems. Now, what about a rudimentary system? For a rudimentary system, since the number of two way work modes is 0, the number of properties needed are 1. Although it says 1, we do not know which one, but if we define more than one properties, it means that all the other properties will depend on one single property. So, you define one single property that will define its state and that will define all the other properties which way you may need to define. Okay. Just the way for a simple compressible system, we have said it is a simple system, so two properties are needed. So, a simple compressible system again two properties are needed. If we select the two properties to be say pressure and volume, then all other properties which uh, can be extracted or which can be defined like temperature, internal energy, entropy will all depend on these two properties pressure and specific volume. Okay. Again thermodynamics does not say that you use pressure and specific volume as the two properties. We can use pressure and say enthalpy as the two properties, then specific volume, internal energy, temperature should be extractable from the values of these two properties. This question still remains, is there a significant property if there is a unique property? That brings us back to our mainstream discussion on the zeroth law of thermodynamics and let us now define a word, again a definition. Just the way we began the discussion of the first law of thermodynamics by defining an adjective adiabatic, here we define a word diathermic. Diathermic is defined again as an adjective, it means not adiabatic and this implies heat interactions possible. So, an adiabatic wall or an adiabatic boundary allows only work interaction, prevents all heat interaction because heat interaction is defined as a non-work interaction, first law. A diathermic wall, a diathermic partition, a diathermic boundary, a diathermic interface means a non-adiabatic wall, boundary, partition, interface means 
work interaction may be possible, but apart from that heat interaction is also possible. And our zeroth law, just the way our first law was a generalization of the behavior of adiabatic systems, zeroth law is based on a study of behavior of systems separated by a diathermic boundary. <coughs> now, the traditional view of zeroth law if you see most of the textbooks and even some very good textbooks are not exceptions to this is zeroth law talks about thermal equilibrium without really defining what thermal equilibrium is. Okay. It says that if two systems A and B are in thermal equilibrium with each other and if A is A can independently be in thermal equilibrium with a, a third system C, then B and C will also be in thermal equilibrium with each other. Okay. So, well this in a way is a part of zeroth law of thermodynamics, but let us go back and look at the proper way zeroth law of thermodynamics is to be studied and appreciated. Okay. Actually, this this traditional statement of zeroth law of thermodynamics has two weaknesses. Number one, we have not defined what thermal equilibrium is and two, this is only a part of the zeroth law of thermodynamics and perhaps a secondary part, the primary part of zeroth law of thermodynamics has not been mentioned at all and maybe that is the reason why we have not defined thermal equilibrium. Zeroth law has two parts. One part, the first part it what, what I will call the existence part and second part is what I call the transitivity part. That is if A is in thermal equilibrium with B, B is in thermal equilibrium with C then A will be in thermal equilibrium with C. Let us see how this is developed. Again, let me emphasize that zeroth law is our study and appreciation of the way systems behave when they are separated or they are allowed to interact with each other across a diathermic wall. Okay. Again, for first law we said let us study an adiabatic system between two specified states 1 and 2 and let us look at different adiabatic processes joining the two states from 1 to 2. Here we look at two systems, let us say system A and system B. Separated by a diathermic part. A diathermic wall allows heat transfer to take place, it allows also work transfer to take place. Okay. So, what we will do is to simplify the argument, we know work transfer is a primitive, some sort of a generalized force and generalized displacement is involved. For example, if the work transfer possible is expansion of a piston we can prevent that interaction by freezing or sealing the piston. If the work transfer is the stirrer tau d theta kind, we can lock the stirrer, so that stirrer work is prevented. If it is the electric kind E d q, we can open the circuit, okay, so that no current uh, flows, no charge is either provided or extracted, it means electrical work is prevented. By restricting such a system, we can set up the two systems and set up the diathermic wall in such a way that 
we look at only the heat interaction that takes place between the two systems. And the experiment we do is the following, it is an exploratory experiment and we do the experiment as follows. Just for illustration and simplicity, I consider the two systems to be simple systems, but that is just because I want to show them on plain paper. So, that two properties. Let us say this is system A, state space of system A, this is state space of system B. And maybe I have x A and y A as the two properties, if you want write P A and V A. And this is x B and y B are the two properties which define the state of system B. Why two? Well, simple illustration, if you take complex system, draw it in three dimensions or four dimensions etcetera. Now, the exploration which we are going to do is as follows. We are going to take our system A in a state here say A 1. And what we are going to do is we are going to initially bring state B system B in different states and allow those states to interact across a diathermic partition with the fixed state of this system A at A 1. And you will find that for most of these experiments, there will be a heat interaction between A and B, A remaining at A 1 and B one of those. But the first part, the existent part says that in the state space of B, there is at least one state, but in general more than one state which will not have any heat interaction with the fixed state of system A when allowed to have heat interaction across a diathermy partition. So, this is the existence for a fixed state A 1 of A. So, that means, if I take A 1, A in A 1 and B in B 1, allow them to interact across a diathermic partition, they will say we will not interact, there is no need for us to interact. And this can be checked out that the state of A 1 will not change, state of B in B 1 will not change. So, that means, there is no interaction, we have already prevented work interaction, we have allowed only heat interaction, but even that does not take place. So, the first part of zeroth law is that in the state space of the system B, there exist states at least one, which will not have any heat interaction with a fixed state of system A, namely A 1. So, this is the existence part. Then again definition, the pair of states A 1, B 1, etcetera, A 1, B 1 and also A 1, B 2 and so on. The states which do not have any thermal interaction or heat interaction with a fixed state of A across a diathermic partition are called isothermal states. Okay. That is definition and this is a part of the definition. These definitions are only to put our earlier 
terms which are used regularly like isothermal, thermal equilibrium on proper footing. So, if I say the state A 1 of A and B 1 of B are isothermal state means that they will not have any heat interaction even when allowed to have a heat interaction across a diathermic separating wall. And A 1 and B 1 are in thermal equilibrium with each other. So, this way we have defined what we mean by a pair of isothermal states and we have defined what is meant by two states being in thermal equilibrium with each other. So, two states of uh, two systems A and B namely A 1 and B 1, if they are in thermal equilibrium with each other that means they are isothermal states and that means by definition they will not have any heat interaction across a diathermic wall. So, this is the first part of the zeroth law of thermodynamics, existence of isothermal states and hence consequence definition of isothermal states and thermal equilibrium. Okay. Now, the second part, the second part is the transitivity part, but for the transitivity part let us extend this. If we extend our experiment, again state space of A, state space of B, we did an experiment with A 1 and we found out that there are a number of states say B 1, B 2, B 3, B 4, B 5, B 6. We did the experiment by fixing A at the state A 1. We can repeat the experiment by fixing the state of B at say B 1 and explore various states in the state space of A. And we will find perhaps that we will have a set of states A 2, A 3, A 4 all in thermal equilibrium with B 1 or any of them isothermal with respect to B 1. So, we have found A 1 B 1 is isothermal, A 1 B 6 is isothermal, A 1 B 2 is isothermal. We have also found B 1 A 2 is isothermal, B 1 A 3 in isothermal and so on. Again extending our definition, this set of states with our continuum and continuous variation of states properties, we will find generally that these are all on a locus this is supposed to be an isotherm in the state space of B and this set of states is known as or is called an isotherm in state space of A. Now, we will link the two isotherms by using the second part that is the transitivity part. Transitivity parts of isothermal states. This is what we all know. We say that let 
A 1 B 1 be a pair of isothermal states. And let us explore the same one and let A 1 and say some C 1 third system. be also a pair of isothermal states. Then the transitivity property implies that if you bring B 1 and C 1 together across a diathermic part, they will not interact. They will also be isothermal states and that means let us go back to our experiment. We have said that look with respect to A 1, any one of these is an isothermal state. With respect to B 1, any one of these is also an isothermal state. Now, what we will do is we will create a replica of system A. That means, a perfect copy of system A. One, we will bring at A 1, another we will bring at A 3. And we know A 1 and B 1 are isothermal states. We also know that A 3 and B 1 are isothermal states. So, if we bring A 1 and A 3, two copies of the same system at two different states together across a diathermic wall, we will know that they are also isothermal states. So, that gives us the importance of the word isotherm in this and isotherm in this state space. Extending this, if we create a replica of B, you will find for example, that B 1 and B 5 are also isothermal states. Not only that, extending this argument, we will see that you bring system A at any one of these and let it interact with any one of the systems B at any one of these states. B 1, B 2, B 3, they will be in thermal equilibrium with each other. So, this isotherm and this isotherm, this and this are now known as corresponding isotherms. in the state space of A and state space of B respectively. Now, what is the importance of this? The importance of this is by mapping isotherms, we can ask determine whether Q interaction will take place or not between two systems at which are in specified states. For example, let us now extend the experiment like this. We have system A and we have system B. Again the two properties of A, let them be X A and Y A. Two properties of B, let B X B and Y B. And we have already done one experiment, we will say this had A 1 etcetera on it and this we had B 1 etcetera on it. Then let us repeat the experiment and select some other state of A, say A 11. And we will find that in the state space of B, we will have a set of states 
may be B 11 on them, but others 11, 12, 13, etcetera, which are all isothermal with respect to the A 11 state of system A. And then we select one of these and find out the corresponding isotherm here like this. And then we repeat the experiment maybe with another state of A, say A 21 and we find that in the state space of B there is another set of states maybe with B 21 and other states on it which are isothermal with this state of A. And then fixed one of these and you will find that there is a corresponding isotherm here. So, we will have a black isotherm here in state space of A, black isotherm in the state space of B, maybe a blue isotherm in the state space of A, blue isotherm in the state space of B, green isotherm in the state space of A, green isotherm in the state space of B and maybe if you want even a red isotherm in the state space of A and the red isotherm in the state space of B. Okay. Now, what does this help us to determine? It helps us to determine, suppose we are given answer to the question which is as follows. Let us say we are given a state A naught of A and state B naught of B. And we have to answer the question, if I allow state A naught and state B naught to interact with each other across a diathermic wall, will there be a heat interaction or not? All that we have to do is find out which is the isotherm or what is the color of the isotherm to which A naught belongs. Suppose it belongs to the blue isotherm here. We find out the isotherm or the color of the isotherm to which B naught belongs. If it belongs to green, then we will say yes, there will be a heat interaction. But if instead of green, it belongs to blue, then we will say no, there will not be any heat interaction. If it belongs to any other isotherm other than green, other than blue, which is the isotherm of A naught, we will say that a heat interaction will take place. That is all we can do here. We cannot determine whether the heat interaction will be from A to B or from B to A. Now, if this is understood, then the next definition. definition of temperature. Now, remember what we did, we said that given a state A naught of A and given a state B naught of B, we can say that if they are allowed to interact across a diathermic wall, then heat interaction will take place. If they do not belong to corresponding isotherms, but if they belong to corresponding isotherms say blue and blue or green and green and uh, black and black or red and red, then no interaction will take place. Okay. To simplify this, we define a temperature. The definition of temperature is simply temperature is nothing but a label provided to corresponding isotherms in the state space of various systems. In our illustrative case, we have just considered two 
systems A and B, but we can extend it. We can have a system C, we can map out the isotherms just the way we have done this and then we will have a map of uh, state space of C with appropriate isotherms, the location of red, blue, green, black, brown, what you have. Okay. So, these labels provided are called temperatures okay. and remember that temperatures are nothing but labels, one for every isotherm. And what is the advantage? After defining this temperature, we will say that A naught and B naught will not have a heat interaction if the temperature of A naught and temperature of B naught are the same. What does it mean? That means, the isotherm label for state A naught, isotherm label for state B naught is the same. That means, the states A naught and B long belong to this pair of corresponding isotherms in the respective state spaces and hence there will be no heat interaction. Okay. Now, remember that labeling these isotherms is rather arbitrary. I have labeled it as black, blue, green, red because some colors were possible. For example, I could have defined an yellow isotherm. I do not think you are able to see it. I could have defined a pink isotherm. But now, this is arbitrary. I could have named them after stars for example, or after famous cricketers for example. Okay. So, we could have a Gavaskar isotherm, we could have a Tendulkar isotherm, and we could have a um, Nariman isotherm okay, and so on. This arbitrariness will not work. So, we come to the science of thermometry 